Okay, so here again, and um, indeed, uh, I will present now, together with Doyle Stevik, which we have led together the research team, I will present the frame of the study, and the first part of the study, the language report, and Doyle will present the second part, which is the thematic report. And then you go on in the workshops. This study has been carried out, you have already heard it, but I wanted to visualize it by a team composed of two bodies, the steering committee, who defined the research, hired the team, made the whole plan and organized the conference, and followed the whole co process, and the research team, which, who did the concrete work of the research. So I'm speaking here now in my double function as chair of the steering committee and as a researcher in the team. I will start and lay out the, re the research the following points. I want to give a bit the context of the idea, the aims of the, of the research, the terminology dilemma we faced, the research pro process, products, the outcomes. Results is a bit too much said, and it's always difficult to deal with, with results in this field. I, I would like to give an overview of the language reports, language region reports, but I'm afraid we are a bit late and I have to shorten this. And I will to give just some ideas on the challenges I see and then hand over to Doyle. So the context. It, in the 15 years since the founding of the IRA, the field of teaching and learning about the Holocaust has actually really developed. And at the same time, it has been professionalized and institutionalized. It means from NGO to state initiatives, from activism to professionalization. And when I mean professionalization, there is to both aspects. The persons are more better trained, professionally, uh, more professionals. But also it is more anchored in institutions, in school programs, in col not anymore on, only on voluntary ba basis. So more curricular and more and more curricular activities and not only extracurricular activities. We have also an increasing uh, NGO initiatives parallel to this, educational programs, guidelines, etc. But what IRA really wanted and intended was the shift from the bottom-up initiatives to the state commitment, a top-down initiative. And this means also a paradigm shift for educator, uh, educators, which I will come back later to it. But this is a main shift. And parallel to this, we have an emerging field of educational research in, in all these uh, sciences, rapid de development of empirical research. Um, there are, especially by Simon Schweber, who will speak this, even, uh, this evening or this afternoon, brilliant reviews, but as she says herself, they are limited to publications in English, which regrettably exclude the work in other languages and give it an Anglo-centric bias. So this opens exactly what we want to do, is not to stay in that bias. And thirdly, the, uh, there is not a lot of dialogue. The IRA does not know a, a, a lot about the educational research, and the educational researchers do not know a lot about the IRA. So there is a need of dialogue between both. So logically, the aim of the education research project is to collect empirical research studies dealing with teaching and learning about the Holocaust, to provide a cross-language and cross-national mapping of these studies, and to, to pro provide an overview of the state of research and of the knowledge produced by empir empirical research. So it's important to be clear, we did not collect data on pupils, on teachers, on curricula. We collected studies and analyzed the studies. It is a secondary al analysis. And we wanted to do this as large as possible in the largest range of countries. And to foster ex exchange across all these uh, different bridges which need to be bridged. As a multilingual project, as it has already been uh, said, we had to face a lot of terminology dilemmas. And I wanted just to point out three of them because they're really real obstacle when you go deeper into discussion. The first the classical uh, terminology dilemma is the word Holocaust itself. 
when we work in English, we have to translate uh, concepts. No, we cannot always translate them. We have to transpose them. The word Holocaust, first of all, it no has not always been obvious. It has been named uh, uh, Hurban, Shoah, Holocaust, genocide of the Jews, destruction of the Jews. And if in the Anglo-Saxon world, Holocaust has become unquestioned, this is not in use in all languages. So, in French, as you probably know, the word Shoah has, has established itself in public discourse. It is not in the curriculum, but it is in public discourse. And Holocaust is hardly ever used in French. Um, this is also the case in most Latin languages. Except in French-speaking Canada, under the influence of English-speaking Canada, they use the word Holocaust. By the way, Israelis, when they speak in Hebrew, they say Shoah, and when they speak in English, they say Holocaust. Then, uh, but neither Holocaust nor Shoah are used in Germany. Neither nor. There, the expression genocide of the Jews, the Volkermord and the Juden is preferred. And uh, in addition, German Brodens actually, and this is the second uh, discussion topic within language, broadened the topic to the concept of national socialist crimes, including the fo focus on perpetrators crimes. Also, both the concept of Holocaust and Shoah have both been criticized for their ahistorical and even sacralizing meaning. And therefore, some scholars come back today to Hilbert's destruction of the Jews or to genocide of the Jews. So when we were searching in our studies, we could not use the same keywords in the different languages. That is, that is clear to us, but it was not clear in the beginning. And there is also a critique of the concept of Holocaust education. The contraction of Holocaust education is strange in English, but it is even more strange when you want to translate it. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, it, it has a very, very tricky outcome, like if you want to educate to the Holocaust. So it cannot be translated. It, it's also reflected often this universal meaning of the Holocaust as opposite to democratic or US values, and the transmission of the Holocaust becomes a pretext for general moral education when contracting to Holocaust education. This is why we try to find, the word, find another wording, which is education about the Holocaust or teaching and learning about the Holocaust. Now, education about the Holocaust includes more informal settings, and teaching and learning about the Holocaust is um, is uh, more for schools. And this is why the conference is called Research on Education about the Holocaust and not Holocaust Education. Finally, the question is if we should put the focus here on Holocaust or on education. I want to leave, I think this is one of the things we should discuss. Now, the research process. We collected empirical studies, and this is the definition we gave to empirical studies Col that collect original data and analyze them in a transparent way. I don't read it, you can read it. This is how we defined our focus. And we had three main steps with three main products. We have located and evaluated if these papers we found are really uh, research, and we created a set of bibliographical lists. Then we analyzed of what is going on in each language region, and we made eight language reports, and we created then four thematic reports, and I will speak now about the lists and the language report, and Doyle about the thematic reports. Just before that, an overview on what did we find. I tried to put together the numbers. What is, what is the material we worked with? We found more or less 650 articles written on research on Holocaust education. When we looked more closely, some were not real research or half research and some concerned, some articles concerned the same research. There is a scholar who might written, have written a book and an article and, a, and a, a, a review. So we tried to find out how many studies are behind that. So these are the two columns you have here, 650 uh, research papers covering more or less 375, it's approximative um, research uh, studies. 
It is not so easy to identify it. In Anglo-Saxon world, you work by uh, electronic da databases and uh, everything is available online. Uh, in the other languages, we had to go to the libraries to consult uh, books, uh, published reports, paper, and not online, and journals. So the search was complicated. Um, what comes out is actually, there is a lot of research. 375 studies, that's more than most of us thought, that's more, by the way, than the IRA thought. So at the first, time, first moment people said there is no, no research around, but there is research around. There is a variety of methods, slightly predominant qualitative research, but also quite a number of quantitative studies. But we found our overall rather small studies um, and this is also uh, an important point because uh, large studies need large financial public support, mostly by national research foundations or by uh, st bodies like the European Framework Programs for Research. There is only one research financed by a European program. So I wanted to show you, but this is really approximative, who are the founders of this research in the several languages. And what we can see is there is a lot of PhD. There is a lot of uh, university studies going around, but not a lot of, of big grants. Again, you can see that the claims conference, the Fondation pour la mémoire de la Shoah, found some that is one project founded by the EU Comenius. But if we want big studies, we need big support. That is for the Founders' Roundtable, I think, a very important issue. And also, to be established in academia, this kind of research needs to be more in line with research programs reaching out to other topics. Not to be a separate research community, but to have a discourse and a debate within a, range, a broader range of uh, research studies. Also, the number of PhD projects might point to the fact that many scholars are interested in the beginning of their career and maybe later have to broaden their topic. It's just a hypothesis. Now I would like to go on to the language region reports. Works? I don't know actually how we are with the time. Peter, Peter Gauci will help us. Is he disappeared? Take another. Okay. Um, I actually, we went from the search, we, we collected publications, we listed them. We listed authors, we did abstracts in English. I come back to this. And then we found actually by an examination, uh, examining what was lying in front of us, that there were connections, common discourses, clusters, that there is something within a language region which is a common, a common discourse, even though the historical and social uh, contexts might not always be the same. An example is French uh, is spoken in France, in French-speaking Switzerland, in Belgium and in Canada. The systems are not the same, but the researchers know each other. They have in dialogue with each other. And by the way, we also remarked that researchers own mostly uh, communicate in their own language and quote, mainly work published in their own language and very little cross-language. And this is also an issue that we have to be more aware of each other's studies. So we created a set of eight language region bi bibliographies, which will look like this. Oh. This. So this is just an example of the French list. Uh, we wanted to make available the titles, translated to English, and abstract, translated or made by our work. Don't read it, it's not final. It's just an example. Um, but the interest is that you can have access to publications in 15 languages without knowing all the 15 languages. Of course, you cannot know the details of a, of a publication by an abstract, but you can read an abstract in English, from, uh, in English which has been translated from Russian, from uh, Danish, from French, from Spanish. Uh, also, you might not know these languages. So this is the first outcome of the project. 
And then the second outcome is that region, regional discussion, which I would give a little frame. And I would like to say something about each, each region. Just to be very clear, English has studies from UK, US, Canada, Australia, mostly, and some others. Nordic region embraces Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, and Finnish. Slavic, Ukrainian, Belarus, and Russian language. Polish is Polish, German is German, Switzerland, Austria, um, and Germany. French includes, as I already said, uh, French, Canada, and Belgium. And the Romance languages is Italian, Spanish, and Portuguese. And then we added also Hebrew because we were aware of the fact that many Hebrew research is published in English, but that we need to know about the Hebrew, um, the Hebrew research, which has not been published a little bit more, which gave also a separate language report. So you can kind of map this, and you can say something about each country, which I will try to make in a short way, and you can go deeper in your uh, workshops afterwards. Amazingly, it is not English, actually, that has the largest number. I remind you that here is not the publications, but the studies. And it's an approximation, but nevertheless. Amazingly, or maybe not so much amazingly, German is the biggest number of research compared to the population uh, it, it deals with. This can be explained by the still ongoing interest and debate in, in, in German-speaking countries, and also, by the way, a growing debate and interest here in Switzerland. This has produced a very rich theory building. Just let's think of the concepts of historical consciousness, historical <coughs> thinking and historical competencies, pedagogical communication and interaction, and things like this. And the fascinating field in German is the strong development of research into education on memorial sites. One of the major concerns of research in German language is the gap between officially declared educational goals and intentions and actual outcomes. And this is clearly faced to the difficulty of dealing with the own past. The question is still current if grandfather was he or was he not a Nazi. All those who know Harald Welzer's work know from what I'm speaking. And this trend contains also a risk of outsourcing to migrants uh, the problem. And uh, so um, the, some, some, some uh, educators uh, fear that migrant students or mi students of migrant background would, would feel less concerned by learning about the Holocaust or even be reluctant. And uh, this, this tendency contains the risk of uh, discharging the German feelings of guilt to others and outsourcing a problem to the migrants. On the other hand, dealing with student migrant background has offered the opportunity to develop very interesting and highly uh, challenging new pedagogical approaches. You can find this in the abstracts, and uh, I can recommend you that. The Nordic discourse. Regarding their historical experience, the Nordic country can be seen as on the periphery of the Holocaust. And this gave rise to a very different narrative that downplays the involvement such as collaboration, but nevertheless, it is not the perpetrator's nation. This is also reflected in the way the Nordic countries deal with the history of the Holocaust in curricula is mostly linked to a broader topic and not separately there. As for the research, there is a growing research community and quite united, where regional approach has been developed rather than a national approach, and where re researchers are a lot of dialogue with German and Anglo-Saxon theory building. The French discourse is contrasting with the former two. There, the relation between memory and history, social representations of the past and of the present, and memorial processes, and the role for nation building is in the forefront of research and of teaching and of debate. There is a very strong focus on victims and testimonies, especially in France. At that point, that the French researcher, François Lantôme, warns of the risk of depolitization of, uh, of history because the compassion with victim is not sufficient to allow a common political understanding. 
In France, there is an underlying question which is everywhere, is the so-called reluctant resus resistance to learning about the Holocaust among students with Arabic and Muslim backgrounds. But even if concrete examples have been publicized, none of the research really proves that there is a, a range of reality on this. So we are there in a, in a gap. It seems not to be uh, quantitatively relevant, but the studies point to the background of competing memories of the Holocaust and of French colonization. The Romance Languages report, um, Spanish, Portuguese and Italian, have many common concepts and discourses with the French discourse. And there is also some kind of dialogue between Latin languages, distinction between history and memory, the processes of memory relation and so on. But whereas in France it is the colonization issue that is the main focal point of comparison, in Spain, Portugal and in Latin, Latin America, the Holocaust works as a possibility with often silenced past of recent dictatorships. And it, to deal with the Holocaust is often uh, a possibility to deal un indirectly with a traumatic past without confronting it directly. And in this context, educational research is a bit less more recently emerging, less advanced, and deals actually nowadays mainly with textbook knowledge and attitudes of students, encounters with survivors, but I'm sure it will follow also the other languages' uh, strengths. The Polish research is very rich, you see it's a big bubble, and this might be due to effort of specific researchers rather than of a policy, and this is also the moment to say that the amount of research cannot be seen as the merit of a country because it is not really the outcome of a, of a country. Even if, it's, if a country can support research, at the very end it's an individual researcher who takes the initiative to make a research. The country's communist past leaves, of course, a heavy heritage when Jews were absent in the historical memory. And uh, in Poland, dealing with the Nazi occupation means challenging the Polish narrative of World War II. So uh, there is a competing of memories, if I be short, of victimhood between Jews and Poles. And the Polish research addresses very much the effects of education on social representations, on stereotypes, on, on prejudice, and on attitudes of young Poles, Poles towards Jews. And there is also a strong education and research group on focus on intergroup relations and intergroup encounters, which happen very often. And the, the impact and lasting effect of such encounters is measured. And this question is still open if, under what conditions, encounters have positive effects and under what, con uh, and under what conditions they have backlash. A bit in line with the Polish situation is the Slavic study, the post-Soviet space, which has a lot of literature, but not many proper research studies. This is a, a, a space where research is emerging. And in a first um, stage, uh, the research mainly deals with uh, teacher's experiences and uh, narratives of, uh, of, of, um, of educational uh, programs. In this space has developed a published discourse about the Holocaust in the context of national nar narratives. And um, also the, the Jewish victims have been silenced during decades during the Soviet uh, occupation. So the Holocaust is recognized, but the responsibility is also deferred to others. The main... Um, oh no. Uh, research is also mainly dealing with the development of public memory in these states between national and nationalist narratives and Soviet concepts of the one hand, which live a compact, and Western con con concepts, which have been imported by, partly, the IRA and other Holocaust entrepreneurs. So this report is so complex and so rich that I cannot say more here. I only can recommend you to assist to the workshop dealing with it because you have a fascinating landscape of uh, Russian, Belarusian, Ukrainian and also the Baltic states. And, la and now to English. Research published in English is difficult to sum up because we have different categories of research published. One is 
the category of research led by Anglo-Saxon researchers in their domestic context. But that's not most. It's only the third of it. This is why we had before this number in... Um, in um, oh, I, I cannot find it anymore. Oh, yes, here it was. 35. Only a third of it is actually dealing with domestic issues. This was quite a surprise because actually uh, in English you have studies done by Anglophone scholars going to other contexts, mainly to Eastern Europe, and um, studies on Anglo-Saxon context and studies who have been done in other languages and published in addition to their own language in English. So what is common really proper to the Anglo-Saxon context is the past of not having been uh, Axis powers, but allied powers, that they don't have to face the responsibility of former pet perpetrators and have less to deal with competing memories than other, other, universe, uh, other countries. So researchers deal with questions of curricula and textbooks and with students and teachers' knowledge and attitudes. And, some, um, and there is a lot of uh, interest also in focusing on moral education and the outcomes of teaching about the Holocaust for moral uh, reasoning and civic attitudes. There are also some studies by organizations such as Facing History and Ourself, ADL and the USHMM, which are rather evaluation studies. And last but not least, uh, no, 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 last but not least, the Hebrew list, <laughs> which is, of course, a very special list. I mean, Israel is a special case. In Israel, uh, following Eric Cohen, 60% uh, of the teachers lost family, in the Holocaust, family members in the Holocaust. Almost 60% have survivors in their families. So the, the relationship is a very different than anywhere else in the world. And uh, there is a very uh, big focus on emotional as well as cognitive uh, components. In consequence, research in Hebrew is at addressing a lot of issues of knowledge about the Holocaust, but also of the emotional comp uh, impact, and focuses a lot on Israeli Jewish identity building. Um, the researchers analyze also the journeys to Poland. You know that Israeli scholars do, um, uh, st students do journeys to Poland, and they analyze the cognitive and emotional impact of this trip, highlighting the risks of sacralizing this trip as a ritual, and, um, but also the gain of gaining knowledge. So the pl place of the Holocaust in Israel curriculum has also been widely analyzed, and I think we have a scholar here who has done this. And comparison between state, secular, and religious educational systems are also uh, uh, very much dealt with, uh, especially by the regretted Eric Korn, who we miss here. I'm sorry that he is not anymore amongst us. I would like to make some comments and. Can uh, It's okay. Okay, very shortly. There are some missing research topics. There is no specific research about the genocide of the Roma, or teaching about the genocide of Roma, although we know that this is a topic which Ira emphasizes very few gender issues and very few social class issues. There are big differences as regarding educational and historical context. I think I've said enough about this. But there are also differences, and I would like to hint to that for our discussions, striking difference in general teaching traditions and pedagogical settings. It is striking to what point in some countries there is a workshop-style peer education, like in Northern Europe, in Anglo-Saxon contexts, and to what point there is a top-down lecturing style uh, ex cathedra, uh, which is especially in France, but maybe also in the former Soviet Union. And we could ask the question, is the gener general educational issues might not be under-considered? For example, is resistance and reluctance to teaching and learning about the Holocaust, as is dealt with in France, really due to the specific topic of the Holocaust? Or is it opposition, in general, to education and to authority? And we should take this more into consideration. So I would then just to like to conclude with three challenges. I think we should pay more attention to educational traditions in these contexts. 
And maybe instead of putting the major focus on problems of ethnic origin of students, focusing on the role of pedagogical traditions and styles and the characteristics of school systems. The second um, uh, we could focus on is that the paradigm from the bottom up to the top down situation puts the educators in a new position. He is not anymore going against the mainstream, he is with the mainstream and he represents authority. He even, if before he was fighting against, in some contexts, not everywhere, the silencing of the Holocaust, now he is going with decreeing the Holocaust. And this can raise, raise opposition to authority. And um, many studies point to the hit that too much moral, not enough history, that the focusing on moral education and emotions rather than on knowledge can completely distort the relationship and provoke resistance and reluctance there where it, where it is not intended. But overall, I just wanted to say that the most of the studies say that it's not a problem to teach about the Holocaust, but that there is a raising interest in it. Good morning. You know, normally when Monique tells me something, I believe her. But one time, she told me she was retired. And that's just not a credible claim. Uh, of all the recognition we have today uh, for everyone who has contributed, I, I just have to emphasize that Monique has literally donated, dedicated years of her life to make this project possible, from conceiving it to getting the support for it to carrying it through, wearing many hats. Uh, and uh, without her, we, we would not be here today. Uh, her contributions to this are unparalleled. Thank you, Thank you Monique. Uh, this is such a unique project. To my knowledge, there has never been a literature review across 15 different languages in any field. I've been able to, unable to find any other example like this one. And for me personally, it's truly been a pleasure and a privilege to immerse myself in uh, all of this research. It's like spending time in the company of brilliant minds who are uh, dedicated to the most powerful and important issues. Uh, and then to be able to come and meet many of you in person at the end is uh, just icing on the cake, as we say. Um, I will keep my remarks pretty short today, uh, maybe bleed over into my presentation for the next session, uh, because part of the purpose of our conference is to get us to speak to one another, uh, to get to know each other, to plan projects. This is not just transmitting final findings, but it's part of an ongoing dialogue in a field that's growing and expanding. And for that reason, coffee breaks are sacred. Um, the challenge I had uh, with this uh, was that we have so much rich material, uh, and yet it doesn't easily fit together all the time. Uh, so my struggle was to figure out how do we say meaningful things about this mass. I learned so much through the process, and yet uh, at the end I say, what what can I say about it? How can I describe that? So I just want to try to capture uh, that for you to understand the challenge. And I think this gives you a sense of what we were facing. So we have approximately 650 puzzle pieces. Uh, the challenge is that they come from 40 different puzzles. So it means that we have some pieces from some puzzles, some that will fit together, some that are orphans that we cannot link to other things. Uh, it gives us glimpses, but the glimpses are incomplete. Uh, we need many more pieces to these puzzles. Uh, we have a good start, and, and there's great prospects ahead for this. Uh, when I looked at these, I then thought, uh, and you can imagine the context I was in to make this realization, uh, a good image for what we're able to say now when we look at all of those puzzle pieces at the same time is we get glimpses but much is obscured. It's like the view from the airplane when there are many clouds out. You get some glimpses of teachers here and in this context and a third, but overall uh, it's difficult to say anything across all of the contexts. So uh, what we find instead is that when the plane's coming lower to the ground and the clouds clear, sometimes we get spectacular views. Uh, but what I've found most beneficial is the views close to the ground. So what I learned especially from the language reports was profound. 
Uh, when we stay close to the ground, we have a very clear picture and learn a lot. And often the nature of the learning we do from all of this research is deeply contextual so that we learn uh, from one setting maybe things that are transferable from another. Those are the kinds of learning that I felt we most got out of this research rather than a coherent view from 5,000 meters. So staying close to the ground is where I found a lot of, uh, a lot of the value in what we did. Now, I was pleased to see how many of us are involved in educational research here, and it means that I can go quickly through the aspects of educational research. The kinds of learning we can do from educational research aren't just about making grand statements of truth that apply everywhere. Rather, it has to do with uh, influencing practice. It has to do with shaping our perceptions of gaining insights, uh, nuance, understanding. Uh, not just bold claims of uh, universal truth. When I tried to make general statements uh, out of the reports that we had on teachers and teaching, on students and learning, what can I say that is true regardless of context? Well, the truth is uh, that context is deeply meaningful in everywhere we conduct teaching and learning about the Holocaust. Now the other two reports that have to do with intergroup encounters bring multiple contexts together. Or if they deal with sites and museums, very often they're in specific contexts that makes it easier to have uh, uh, these general statements. So I will bypass for now some of the contributions that research makes. We can take this up, if those of you who participate in the panel that Paul and I do later. Um, In general, everyone wants to know the answer to the question, does teaching and learning about the Holocaust work? Now, we do have evidence that links teaching and learning about the Holocaust to positive outcomes. There are improvements in historical understanding, political tolerance, uh, and these are various forms of teaching and learning about the Holocaust in specific contexts. Uh, moral reasoning, improvements in civic attitudes, it can reduce stereotypes, it can reduce prejudice towards Jews, towards others, towards minorities. It can increase empathy, it can support engagement, it can trigger in students a desire to learn more about the subject. Uh, in addition, some students even speak about their experience as transformational. So these are all things that can be con connected to some form of teaching and learning about the Holocaust. But Asking if teaching and learning about the Holocaust works is like asking if medicine works. Well, what medicine? Medicine is a large package word that refers to many, many different kinds of treatments. The same is true for teaching and learning about the Holocaust. We can't think about it as one thing. In addition, uh, for which illness? The question is for what purpose uh, are we pursuing teaching and learning about the Holocaust. So some purposes are better served than others by different approaches. Unfortunately, we don't have enough data to answer concretely uh, which approaches work for which outcomes consistently and in different contexts. Uh, so we don't yet stand in a position where we can definitively answer a lot of the questions that, that we have. Um, so the answer to many of our questions is it depends, and often it depends on what we're not always certain. Context is incredibly important, uh, but what are the salient, relevant aspects of context that are meaningful? It varies from context to context, and that's part of what we get from the wonderful language reports. Um, very briefly, I will share some of the general uh, uh, results uh, or trends, and again, each of these requires a qualifier. But in general, students and teachers experience the subject of the Holocaust as distinct from other topics in the same in the same courses. We see generally high levels of interest and engagement among teachers and students from all backgrounds. Teachers are generally self-taught and desire more preparation, although obviously some cases like Israel or Germany are, are exceptions. Teachers often have very high expectations for teaching the Holocaust, but there are ambiguous goals and purposes. Uh, teachers often lack the ability to judge whether they are succeeding in meeting their goals because they have limited skills to assess more advanced outcomes. 
They can test the retention of information and typically do, but they currently lack often the ability to test higher level thinking skills or, or uh, dispositional outcomes. Um, a number of studies critiqued the knowledge level of students and teachers and we found that the knowledge level expectations tended to be ones that experts held rather than testing the knowledge that was prescribed uh, by the teacher, by the textbook, by the curriculum. So often our portrait of the limited knowledge students have uh, is biased a little worse than it may actually be. That's not to say we don't have gaps that, that need to be addressed or, or examined, but our uh, tendency is to examine people sometimes on things they were not even instructed in. The curricular creep that uh, Simone Schreiber talked about, the, the movement of the Holocaust to younger and younger children was documented in several contexts. Um, and that's an issue that requires us to bring together both normative concerns, value concerns, and empirical issues. Um, the question of teaching and learning about the Holocaust as more effective for addressing ignorance uh, and passive stereotypes uh, often more effective than trying to deal with closely held, consciously held, more ideological uh, positions. Um, so we don't find evidence that Holocaust education is necessarily effective for deprogramming or dealing with uh, strong ideologies, for example. There's some evidence that less confident teachers may lean on emotional or emotive approaches to teaching while confident teachers uh, with more experience and expertise are able to integrate cognitive, affective, and experiential education in their, in their approaches. Uh, in addition, teachers often struggle to navigate the tensions between history and memory, between reason and emotion, and between the broad geopolitical forces and the individual experiences of the Holocaust. Group, en group encounters uh, although expensive, can reduce prejudice uh, and reduce stereotypes about the other group, uh, but not always symmetrically. A power component is often on display in those settings. Critically, uh, changes in mentality that occur as a result of these uh, encounter projects seem to occur during the phase of reflection after the contact. So the reflection emerges as a critical piece in education. Uh, unfortunately, because teachers often feel limited in the time they have available to teach about the Holocaust, normally they fill that time rather than allowing time for reflection. So we don't have much documented evidence of teachers making much time for reflection in, in typical teaching about learning, teaching about the Holocaust. Um, museum and site visits uh, seem to have a kind of authenticity to them, um, but it's difficult to measure the impact of visits, and in fact measuring may be the wrong way of thinking about what they have to contribute. Uh, connecting histories to places, uh, raising awareness may be ways of thinking about the meaning of those visits that are more rewarding. Uh, those site visits, we found, uh, are not often effectively integrated into teachers' practice. Teachers will often bring students to a site, hand it over to the, uh, the people at the museum or, or at the memorial site, let, let them do what they do and, and come back. And there's great potential for greater cooperation between teachers and sites and integrating what they're teaching into the uh, practice. We find that teachers can be anxious about teaching students who have a migrant background many are unsure how to handle references to Israel and Palestine. Um, and an intriguing point that came up, uh, we don't have a lot of research about the use of the internet or the new technologies that are emerging. That's an area we need to address. But some research has shown that the use of interactive technology can be highly scripted. And so it can be overly predictable often reinforcing what is already known and believed through familiar pathways rather than expanding and challenging the uh, beliefs and understandings of those who use it. I believe research has tremendous potential to contribute to our work 
Uh, but we haven't tapped that potential yet. That's why I'm particularly excited about this conference and what we can accomplish here. What I hoped is to encourage some ways of promoting research uh, so that we can make progress on this front. One thing we learned through this process is many major institutions, especially involved in professional development of teachers, do remarkable work, but it's not documented in the literature, so we can't learn from one another. I would encourage these major institutions to uh, share what you're learning, uh, make it available to others so that we can benefit from, from the work. Uh, research is often as it, quite expensive as we've discussed and developing reliable and validated instruments to use uh, is an expensive process. But if we could together fund the development of effective instruments and make them available to the public so researchers didn't have to pay to use them, we could build a significant database uh, and also fund the translation of those instruments. Research conferences like this have great potential to push the field forward. We could do it biannually. Uh, the lessons we've learned from reading the language reports suggest to us that having an open access multilingual online journal uh, would be a great contribution, including abstracts in multiple languages. And we can do that with uh, open source translations. We have many multilingual scholars willing to help that along. Uh, the bibliography we've generated so far is 60 pages by itself. So the tables with the abstracts are going to be quite substantial indeed. Uh, but we shouldn't let that stop. The continuation of, of developing and sharing those abstracts will be a great resource for everyone working in the field. I'd also recommend uh, providing recognition for quality studies, and that's something that can be done without cost. Uh, um, in terms of ways in which we can support research, uh, in addition to the expensive uh, studies that, that we do need, um, grant providers can require evaluations as part of the grants they offer. Uh, also require that those be published. When we do that, we make our successes public in ways that can draw further support, and we can address the weaknesses we have. Uh, but evaluation capacity isn't always present in the organizations. This is something a centralized organization like the IRA could develop, a team of folks who could be consultants to organizations that uh, want to conduct effective evaluations and to propose uh, good evaluation designs for grants and consulting on, on that as we go forward. There's great potential for cooperation there. Uh, a lot of what we need to research is even just descriptive research of what's happening on the ground. It doesn't have to be elaborate, sophisticated in every case, although we need those studies too. For much of what we need, we could have micro-grants available for students, uh, dissertation students, uh, for professors who just need a little support on the ground in, in countries that are under-documented uh, to help that along. And we've seen how much comparative and cooperative research projects can shed light on what we do. Those are the key elements I wanted to uh, draw our attention to. I want to uh, turn the floor back to Monique for a moment so she can speak about the panels uh, and then get to the coffee. Thank you. <coughs>